So, you know, having the idea and believing where the future will go is one thing, but also getting the timing right. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, the, the hardest part. And I think now that uh, as an organization, we are larger and we also have a bit more resources, we have the ability to not only help push an industry, we also have an ability to maybe have more patience. Because if you're an investor, uh, a traditional investor, and you have a five or seven year fund cycle, yeah. well, you can't wait for 10 years for it to happen, right? Yeah. You have to invest on something where the trend goes. And that's what we see in these cycles, whether it's Web3, now AI, and you know, maybe something else in the future. Uh, investors have to follow these cycles because they have to follow their fund cycles. They don't necessarily have to follow the long-term trend. Okay, folks. So now uh, we have met with uh, Mr. Yatsu mm -hmm. from uh, Animoca Brand as a co-founder, executive chairman, and managing director of Animoca Brands. As we know, the leading company uh, in the pre industry with a portfolio that boosts over uh, 415 over uh, investment around with three company, and uh, including a Yuga Labs. Like Infinity, um, OpenSea, Dapper, and a lot of web three company I think has known uh, is have a uh, participate in uh, Animoca brand. So we have uh, in uh, Mr. Yasu here, and I think we have to talk a bit about Animoca brands and maybe about uh, what the uh, opportunity and in your opinion about the industry landscape in the bearish market as we know. Uh, as a builders, maybe we're gonna talk a bit uh, and two uh, twenty minutes about about it. And I think, uh, Mr. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming. And how is Bali? Mm, Bali is great. The weather is wonderful. It's uh, great hospitality. I usually come here in the past, you know, for vacation, right, with family and so on. But uh, this is really, I think, my first work conference that mm. I've been here for. And so far, it was pleasant. So, yeah, thank you for having me. Yep, yeah, sure. Uh, but I think uh, I was uh, talking about transitioning of uh, animal car brands. I mean, mm -hmm. like animal brands, you know, it's not a new company, right? It starts since maybe to, to 2011, perhaps. Around the that. origin of animal car brands is 2011, correct? Yep, 2011. And uh, let's start with why. As you know, yeah, uh, we are, uh, we're really interesting if you're talking about why the reason uh, about animal car brand. But as we know, it's starting as a game developer mm -hmm. and publisher, mm -hmm. is it right? Mm -hmm. And until uh, maybe 2000 and yeah, around 2016, maybe around that, uh, uh, the Animoca brand become a pivotal factor uh, to uh, blockchain, mm -hmm. uh, gamification, and AI. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know that uh, why are you shifting from the game publisher into uh, blockchain? And what do you see in blockchain industry until you? With pivot, perhaps from publisher and focus to Web3 company, also invest a lot in Web3 company. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we pivoted, you could call it a pivot in 2017. In 2017. 2017. But maybe to sort of uh, give a little bit of background, when we went into gaming, we went into mobile gaming in particular. And we saw in around 2009, we were building some of our first applications at the time, um, you know, under Outplays. Yeah. And then in 2010, we saw the potential of the smartphone. So we saw that there was going to be rapid growth. And remember, smartphone in 2010 was a very small market. Yeah, right? exactly. um, Apple had just come out with the App Store on the iPhone. And the iPhone, I think the penetration rates for phones were still maybe less than 100 million at the time. Mm. Uh, for those of you who remember, the number one mobile company in the world was Nokia, right? Yeah. And Nokia's phones were obviously not like a smartphone, but nobody thought, or very few people thought, that Apple had a chance to basically sort of unseat them. And of course, the rest is history. So we saw the trend and we believed that smartphones like Android and um, iOS was going to dominate in terms of the way that we engage with the internet and with information and with access to the web. And so we decided that we needed to be in that space. And with mobile gaming, we, because we had a gaming history as well, we thought we would have an advantage as well. And we basically started in 2011 in January to launch some of our first games. Pretty Pet Salon was probably our first big hit. And we ended up sort of getting quite a bit of um, market share at the time. So the reason I'm sharing the story is to indicate that we like to be early in the space, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of very successful game companies now, of course, in mobile that have come later. But the cost to enter is more expensive. The marketing budgets are higher. You know, it's a more of a red ocean. 
But in 2010, 2011, mobile generally, including mobile gaming, was a completely blue ocean. Nobody yeah. was there. It was all these opportunities. So that actually, I would say, is a little bit how we see the opportunity when we first encountered blockchain. But not because we thought blockchain was a, you know, like that we cared about blockchain specifically in terms of the distributed ledger. It was very interesting technology. But we, at the time, didn't fully understand its potential until we saw CryptoKitties. Mm -hmm. So our studio in Vancouver was involved in helping build CryptoKitties. And its uh, co-founder uh, ended up becoming a co-founder of Dapper Labs. And that's how we became an investor in Dapper, mm -hmm. and a publisher of CryptoKitties in the region. And again, it has to do a little bit with this early adopter movement. We saw a trend, we saw a market, and we understood the potential, or at least we thought we understood the potential, which at the time was about digital ownership. And that is basically why we pivoted, you could say. And why do we do AI? So we actually have uh, over 60 AI investments. Oh, right. And we started investing in AI in 2018. 2018. Yeah, most people don't really know that mm -hmm. because everyone knows this is a Web3 company, but we think AI and Web3 are very intertwined. So if you look at some of our first presentations that we gave about the future of blockchain, and uh, we actually connected it very strongly with AI in 2018 and 2019. And we launched a, you know, and acquired an AI accelerator that would basically help build out in the AI space. So that, that focus has never changed. But I would say that AI is really sort of having its moment uh, and is kind of going similar to where you know, Web3 sort of at least awareness had its moment as well. But to us, AI and Web3 are very much connected, uh, which we can maybe talk to about mm -hmm. later. But it was really about sort of the trends and the impact that we would have. One of the missions for Animoca Brands, outside of you know, delivering traditional property rights, as an ethos, we want to have impact with purpose. Right? Yeah, we want to basically be able to do something meaningful and big that, that is, you know, hopefully, you know, a strong and purposeful and good cause to the world. And so you have to find these things. And sometimes you will not know for many years. Yeah. And then you see something and you say, wait, this is actually really special. And that's basically what we ended up seeing with NFTs. Um, because blockchain enables a way in which we can actually own, sort of really own our digital assets. And today, most of us spend our time mostly online. We are essentially digital dependents. And so we need to find a way in which we can protect and own these things. So a good example, you know, when um, Elon Musk changed Twitter to X, yeah, right? he took the X handle from the person who used to own it for 14 years, I think it was, right? Uh, but more, 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 even more ridiculously, the person who owned the at music handle, mm. he lost it too, right? Yeah. And why? Because he doesn't own anything in, yes. in that world. So that's actually what NFTs and blockchain and digital property rights protects us from, because we are now actually so dependent on our online existence. And that's actually something that we felt was a, a very important calling. That's why Animoca Brands basically not just pivoted, but went all into this. And also why we've made investments, not just in gaming, but broadly in the ecosystem of what we call Web3 and Open Metaverse, because we think it's so important. Yeah, this is very interesting because if we're talking about Animoca Brands, yeah, uh, CryptoKitties as in an, uh, uh, an NFT and mm -hmm. other things, and then like Sandbox, is really right? That's right. Sandbox is one of the product from Animoca Brands. That's data subsidiary, yes. Right. Right. Yeah. And the interesting is like, and you use it too, that you have uh, investing in a lot of uh, company, mm -hmm. AI company. Something in 2018. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very curious about uh, how how you uh, animal brands and maybe your team can can decide the the next trend. I mean, like uh, AI, maybe it's become a trend. Maybe or this year and mm -hmm. or last year since ChatGPT has uh, mm -hmm. booming. Mm -hmm. But you already invest and maybe research about it and yeah, do action for AI since 2018. Mm -hmm. I mean, like. Do you uh, do your team have a, uh, a quite a big research team or other things so so you can move step ahead? I mean, like if we're talking about sandbox, mm -hmm. yeah, when nobody boom uh, talking about metaverse, even Zach haven't talked about metaverse, yeah, right. uh, Animoca with uh, sandbox have a product that yeah, we can use it. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about AI and other things, you you always uh, Animoca but always one step ahead. Do you have one secret perhaps how how you can <laughs> how you can read the trend? <laughs> Um, so I don't know that we have a, like, you know, we're not like a crystal baller in the classic sense, like I wish we could tell the future. Um, I think the way that we think of it is not that we uh, sort of think we know where the future is going. It's where we want the future to go in, in, in a sort of more, I mean, you could say in a more manifesting kind mm. of way. In other words, 
we think this future is better, so we should go there. We're not saying we think the future is there. We, th we say we want the future to go there. Mm. And so if we want the future to go there, what can we do to make it happen? So back in 2017, 2018, I think nobody will dispute that AI was powerful, right? And that was important. But we didn't know exactly how AI would look like. In fact, when we think about OpenAI and ChatGPT, we didn't really understand that LLMs was going to be maybe the pathway for that. Mm -hmm. We invested in other AI stuff, and some of them are doing very well. But that wasn't really, if you think about it, we, we, so we, we couldn't say what type of AI would necessarily be successful, but we knew that AI could be a force of good, and we should invest in this because it would be better for humanity type of thing. And the same was true for NFTs and blockchain. You know, blockchain was going to create more financial inclusion. We believe that. The NFTs provide for digital property rights, meaning we can own a stake in the network. These are very positive things. Is it through the metaverse? Is it through games? Is it through tokenization of general assets? You know, is it for fidgetals, right? Yeah. We don't exactly know which category it's going to really take off. You know, back then people talked a lot about collectibles, yeah. and then GameFi, right? And we invested in all of them. We just understood that that we think was going to be such an important trend that we had to be there and we had to help shape it. So again, it was about what we wanted the future to look like, not necessarily what we sort of thought, um, you know, um, basically we want to lead, but we don't necessarily want to follow if we can, right? Of course, that doesn't always happen. And sometimes we get it wrong. So, you know, um, we invested, just a, a, an interesting story, we invested in, not as Animoca, but again, as part of Outplays, mm. in 2006, I think, in AR. AR. <laughs> Right, 2006. 2006 and 2007, right? Oh. It was not a no smartphone. No because, smartphone. <laughs> uh, it was because every computer had a camera, right? Yeah, yeah. So we thought, oh, that's pretty cool. I can use my laptop and I can read a book and I can see all these items. And we started investing in, in AR, uh, you know, way before people started thinking about AR and building products in AR. And obviously it's too early, right? Yeah. You know, so, so, you know, we were doing mobile, uh, sort of, uh, not mobile, we were doing massively multiplayer online games in 2001, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 2001, 2002, because we thought that it'd be great for people to play online games together. But again, the technology wasn't that mature and so on, right? So, you know, having the idea and believing where the future will go is one thing, but also getting the timing right. Yeah, and that's the, the hardest part. And I think now that uh, as an organization, we are larger and we also have a bit more resources, we have the ability to not only help push an industry, we also have an ability to maybe have more patience. Because if you're an investor, uh, a traditional investor, and you have a five or seven year fund cycle, yeah. well, you can't wait for 10 years for it to happen, right? Yeah. You have to invest on something where the trend goes. And that's what we see in these cycles, whether it's Web3, now AI, and you know, maybe something else in the future. Uh, investors have to follow these cycles because they have to follow their fund cycles. They don't necessarily have to follow the long-term trend. I think we can all agree that I think Web3 is the long-term trend. We yes. can agree that blockchain and sort of public data infrastructure is going to be the future. Decentralized ledgers is a better way. But is it going to take five years, 10 years, 20 years? Right? That's like asking people in 99 or 98. I think many people didn't believe in the internet, but yeah. the people who believed in the internet, they absolutely believed it was going to work. They absolutely believed it was going to be the future. But will it take five years, seven years, or yeah. 20 years, right? Yeah, um, nobody knows. No, nobody knows. And, and then I think that's the part, right? So I think, again, for us, where we think the future should go, I think is easy for us, or easier for us, because we, we want to invest in um, sort of developing products that we think will be better for people, right? If it's good for people, then it should be something we should be doing. Yeah, if it's good for people, yeah, we should something do it. It's interesting. And talking about, uh, as a company that, we can say actively uh, investing in numerous of uh, the project. Uh, I'm going to say, um, what do you uh, perceive as the common mistake as a founder? Maybe you, you talk with a lot of founder in Web3 industry or not. Maybe, yeah, we can say some of them uh, work, some of them maybe uh, struggle with other things. But talking about founders in Web3, uh, Web3 project or Web3 company, maybe you meet all of them. What's the common mistake that uh, he or she did? In the uh, earliest, um, yeah, as you know. I mean, so first of all, founders make a million mistakes. A million right? mistakes. A million mistakes, right? In mm -hmm. fact, I would be very worried if founders don't do mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. Because then I don't think um, 
flounder and perfect as possible. Like it's more like, you know, um, for my own story as well, like there's always mistakes and, and always failures. But the reason why these failures matter is because, the, you know, these are your lessons. Mm. So the way we think of it is that the most successful founders to us have a correlation to the sort of most failures that have experienced, right? Of course, you have to have risk management, all that kind of stuff. But what I'm saying, I guess, is that the key measure, I think, of a successful founder is how they emerge from crisis, how they emerge from a very, very difficult situation. Because that means in order to do that, you have to show that you're adaptable, yeah. that you're flexible, that you're nimble. But you also have to show that you're open-minded, that you're able to take different perspectives. And then, you know, that's the hardest part. Mm. After you take all these perspectives, distill it down into an action plan that may make sense. Moments like this, where we have a bit of a bear market, is a perfect example. Funding is less, resources yeah. are less. So that means that the founders in these businesses have to be more adaptable. They have to be more creative. They have to dig into things that perhaps they never thought they had. They have to discover things in their abilities and in their capabilities and in their contacts and in their resources that they never had to dig in before. And that means you have to have all these qualities. In you know, a very successful market, the kind of founders that emerge are, you know, I would say, still good founders, except that maybe they might not be as flexible mm. because they have a path. And when the path changes, they become uncomfortable with this. Yeah. And I think you know, there are different founders that are good for different stages in a business, right? In the same way that if the business is very mature, then actually it doesn't necessarily make sense to have a founder who is very disruptive because the business has maybe evolved out of the founders. Well, that can happen too. And we see this happening oh. all the time, right? Um, because some people are good at building. Some people are good at sort of maintaining. You yeah. know, there's, there's different ranges, which is why you have a team, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Animoca Brands isn't me. Animoca Brands is a team of a thousand people of, you know, incredibly talented people who all do their parts and you have to augment those skills uh, so that we can basically get to, get to that point. Um, I think the other thing that we like about sort of founders is that, uh, and again, you know, typical qualities, you know, hardworking, ethical, all that kind of stuff. Yes, right. To me, these are standard qualities. Like, yeah. you know, so you, we all have to have them, right? It's a muscle. It's a muscle, <laughs> right? Even if you're not a founder, you still have, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you right. still have to have these qualities, right? Uh, and unfortunately, you know, sometimes, um, you know, it's not easy uh, uh, because in an industry where so much money can sometimes yeah. transact, there's a lot of temptation. So, so, that, so the, I think the ethical standard, particularly in Web3, needs to be even higher than perhaps in um, most, other, most other industries just because of the parameters involved. But I think the one quality we look for that is maybe a little different um, is for founders who are building for a vision or a purpose bigger than their own. Yeah. So meaning that when they're building something, they understand that what they're doing is so important that they're willing to go to the end of the world to make it work because it's important, right? And that's how we see the mission of Animoca Brands, mm. right? The people working there know that they're building something that is important to the world, or at least that's what they believe, um, you know, and as a result, are willing to work harder or faster or, you know, um, you know do things in terms of make the industry progress, which is basically, if you think about it, in, you know, Animoca Brands, really didn't do anything in the investing space until 2017, 2018. Okay. And now we have over 450 investments, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, um, there's not a lot of companies, if any, that can move that fast. But how do you move that fast? Because of the fact that people are driven in that purpose, for instance. And of course, people building these businesses like Sandbox or like Axie Infinity, for instance, with Sky Mavis or Dapper Labs. I mean, these are, these were very open sea. These were very small companies in 2018, 2019, and today are generally all billion dollar enterprises, right? So that is, again, really only possible, we think, if the people building behind it are building for a vision and a purpose bigger than their own. Because if you do that, then you're able to sacrifice too, yeah, right? Exactly. Like, you know, if you're, why, you, why would you separate from your family for a long period of time? Why would you be willing to fly around the world and attend conferences, for instance? Yeah. Why would you want to sort of, you know, be, you know, um, living in a suitcase or working 18 hours a day sometimes. It has to be that important. Yeah, yeah basically. 
Yeah, and then and besides we are talking about the investing or maybe uh, a lot of uh, point of view from uh, from you as a chairman as an investor um, I'm a bit curious that we are talking about a bit about web tech post in Hong Kong mm, sure uh, yes. you know, like uh, uh, maybe in a uh, few days ago uh, you you're joining web tech task force mm-hmm. from uh, for Hong Kong government yes uh, every day curious and Also, yeah, we we talked a bit about oh, regulation before we take a shot. Of course, yeah. of course. I mean, like, uh, I'm very curious. Then uh, Indonesia, as we know, is forward looking approach from uh, for crypto regulation. Mm-hmm. We we are um, uh, mostly and usually adopt mm-hmm. uh, like we have a list from crypto and we have a lot of updated regulation. And I think uh, I just want to know a bit about Web3 Task Force. Uh, sure. I mean, like, yeah. Uh, could you provide insight into your role, maybe sure. uh, as a you're yeah. uh, in as a professional, yes, and your role in Web3 task force in mm-hmm. Hong Kong, and how much you endeavor their potential inspire uh, inspire us, maybe mm-hmm. in Indonesia, maybe we can create some of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, one has to recognize that Hong Kong is trying to really be a regional, if not global, leader in Web3. Right, they're being very aggressive. They've got you know a licensing regime now. They're sort of expanding that. You can do retail trading in crypto for a certain set of tokens and expanding that. And there's a parameter around it. You know, HKMA has put out a tokenized green bond. There's talk about the e-Hong Kong dollar, you know, CBDCs. So Hong Kong is moving very, very aggressively towards basically trying to become a leader in Web3, Mm. which is very encouraging. And so the purpose of the Web3 task force is to advise and support the government in its efforts to promote Web3. And it's very encouraging that they ask companies and individuals like myself to join the task force because we are from the industry so we can advise them what yeah. to do right so you could say it's split between government and between sort of industry professionals and that frankly speaking is i think a very good model because this is a way in which the industry the businesses can through dialogue with the government advise them what might be the best approaches of course the ultimate decision maker is the government but who informs the government at the end of the day I think this is true for all governments in the world. You know, they have to exist in a very theoretical plane because you don't have time to be doing, you know, the work, you know, on the ground and then work in government, right? It's just, you just don't have that time. So you need to get on the ground experience. And I think the task force does that. So we advise them, we support them. You know, for instance, FinTech Week is coming. Uh, Ape uh, Fest is coming to Hong Kong also in early November. All these things are happening around the same time as a basically as a way to help promote Web3. And part of our job is to spread the word and talk on sort of, you know, videos like this or go to conferences and talk about the role of Hong Kong. So we're not just, I would say, you know, advising them. We're also ambassadors. But I would say because Hong Kong is so, so much trying to move and lead in Web3, you know, we have almost a duty to tell people that Hong Kong is here, that Hong Kong is open for Web3 business. You know, open your business there, do stuff there. Um, you will have support. All these things um, basically is also part of, of what we try to sort of help people know about this. And I think it's a great model for other governments to emulate because it's also kind of risk-free. Mm. If you think about it from a government, right? Governments don't like to take risk. Yeah. We totally understand, yeah. right? After exactly. all, you know, and, and this is the thing, right? Governments have to be stable, but businesses can be risky, right? Businesses are supposed to be Something unstable. pushing the envelope, supposed to be unstable right? to create innovation <laughs> yeah, and, and, exactly. and and sort of create a almost like a risk a sandbox risk of their own in terms of a small small sort of area which if it doesn't work it's their issue but not other people are impacted. Um, so you gain that experience. So to create a task force, if Indonesia was to launch a Web three task force to invite industry leaders, I think it's a great opportunity because the cost to the government is low, mm. relatively speaking. They get input and they get feedback, right? But the benefit for the industry is great because the industry now has a voice. They can talk to someone, whether they like something, they don't like something. It doesn't make them friends necessarily. It just makes them potential allies in building it. I also think it's valuable because it means that the industry learns what the government is concerned about. But right? if I don't have a way to talk to government and say, um, what are you worried about in Web3 or crypto, especially last year, mm-hmm. right? Then they will do policies that have nothing to do with our concerns and vice versa. So we need to have a way in which if they have a concern, we can answer, we can address it. And the committee of people should be many committee members, not just one or two or three, because they represent a 
sort of a cross section of the industry. You want to make sure that you have all the views. You don't want to have just one or two views because then you have sometimes self interest or you have sometimes people who might sort of advise the government, you know, in a manner that benefits them but not others, right? So I think, again, all of these things um, are sort of, I think, a good setup to have sort of that kind of set, um, sort of structure. In places like Japan, though, which is also worth looking at, you know, Web3 and the metaverse is being pushed very hard. Uh, the government has many working groups. There, they also work with various universities to create research. Uh, I think Japan is maybe the only country in the world that has an NFT white paper, for instance. Right? Yeah. 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 And they also have a DAO working group yeah, at yeah. the government. So, again, these are all things that um, different places in the world are doing. So, Indonesia doesn't have to do something new. Mm. They just have to say, what's Japan doing? What's Hong Kong <laughs> doing? Great. What's Dubai doing? What do we like? And just start from there. Yeah, it's interesting. So, so I mean, like, in this task force, uh, all of the member is just from professional, like, like you or... Uh, you so, it's half or roughly, uh, sort of, I think it's half government and then half essentially... Uh business operations which includes academics yep oh, so okay, we do have we have uh, you know uh, people from academia from universities uh, and then we have from business um you know those, yeah so it's, it's a cross section yep 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 maybe uh i've got like, one last question for sure. for you uh about uh, as you know there's a bearish uh, market and hmm. and i think if we're talking about crypto yeah there is always wave um, bullish, bearish, and other things. And uh, the bad thing is, we, we build something in Web3. We, sometimes we depend on the market. Yeah? As you know, when it's bullish, yeah, everyone burning the money, do something, and get money. But when the bear is uh, coming, yeah, as, as we know, like this, uh, it's kind of uh, selection, and like there is some fail, some, some, some still going, mm. even struggling. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's your advice? For maybe builders out there who still believe in Web3, believe in NFC, blockchain, other things, yes. as you're building, okay. even in the bearish time. And what do you, what do you think about, uh, is bearish and bullish always become a problem for Web3 okay. company in a so, few years? So first, um, building and investing in a bear is actually a very good thing because the people who are still building successfully in a bear market are the ones who can really succeed when it's a bull, right? Ah. right? I, and, and it's during this moment where things are difficult that you recognize who are the ones who actually could last for the long time, right? Think about just how we made investments in 2018, 2019, which was the real bear. For those of you who don't remember or were not in crypto in 2018 and 2019, Bitcoin at one point, I think, was less than $3,000. Hmm. And Ethereum... Was I, I remember buying Ethereum, I think it was 2019 or maybe late 2018, I don't remember, at $85. $85. $85, okay? So, you know, a lot has changed. And I don't think anyone believes that Ethereum will ever go back to $85 or that Bitcoin is going to be $3,000, right? In other words, when you compare the lens of the market over the last three to four years, it's broadly up, yeah. right? It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a straight line, but it's broadly up. And so to me, this is the state of the broad industry. We think of Web3, crypto as an economic landscape. We don't think of it as a product. We think of it as almost like a nation, like a new country, right? So just chart Indonesia's growth as an economy over the last 30 years. It's not a straight line. It's like this, right? Yeah. But is Indonesia better today than 10 years ago? Mm. Is it better than 20 years ago? Is it better than 30 years ago? And I would say for most, especially Southeast Asian nations, that's true. But it was this, right? Yeah. Asia economic crisis, yeah. Lehman, some scandal, this thing, whatever, right? So the country was rocked. There were problems. People lost jobs. But at the end of the day, broadly, the economy went up. And this is true also for crypto. So if you are thinking of a... You know, because so many people in, in crypto are traders. So they think in the lens of one week <laughs> or one month. But when you think of the lens of years, which is what human development and society takes, then actually we're not too worried, right? So make sure, though, that during the times when you have dips, that you obviously survive. Mm. And it's not just fundraising. It's, you know, maybe, you know, you need to tighten the belt. You need to maybe restructure your cost because the market is smaller, right? 
you built a business, for instance, and this is the hard part. If you're building in a bull market, yep. you think the market goes like this. And when it's a bear, you have to adjust for this, mm, which yeah, means exactly. that, you know, people have to be let go and so on. And through our, port- our portfolio, you know, and, and ourselves and everything, it's very normal to be reassessing the market and to basically look at, you know, what can you optimize in the business? This is normal for business. This is not a Web3 thing. This is a business thing, right? This is an operations thing. Every business, every operation in the world has to go through these cycles. Web3 and blockchain is, in our view anyway, a capitalist narrative. Right? Mm. Financial systems and value embedded with digital assets and yes. digital technology. Right? It is perhaps the most, I would say, politically, economically embedded technology or example of a technology there is, right? because it's so close to that. So that means that in Web3, you have more, even more obviously, a capitalist narrative. And what happens in the capitalist narrative always is boom and bust. Mm. Right? Now, that's not to say that boom and bust is um, that you, you want to avoid basically having this, you know, being caught in these cycles. But I don't think it's possible in a capitalist environment to not have sort of, you know, um, sort of, you know, uh, bear and bull, which is basically what Wall Street is about. Yeah. I mean, you just take a look at the markets, forget, yes. just forget crypto, just take a look at stock market, uh, industry, energy, technology, mining, yeah. space exploration. <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Every industry in the world has bull and bear, right? So the key factor for, I think, a successful business is how you risk manage and hedge yourself and manage the business so that you can go through these trends. Because fundamentally, if you believe that Web3 is you know, important and is here to stay, which we believe as well, yep. then you know where the trend is going long term, yeah. right? You, you know, like, it's, it's like if you were believe in internet in 1999, yep. 2000, 2001, you know where the trend is going. You don't know if it's going to take 20 years, but you know where it's going. So just make sure that you can survive the cycles through this and build valuable services and products for your community. Sure. So yeah, uh, the best time for build is in bear. Yeah. We think so, because if you build in a bear, then you are already optimized. Yep. And if talking about bear and bull, yeah, every industry have it. That's right. <laughs> every industry have, and uh, we just need to believe, like we believe in the internet in 1990 perhaps. Yes. And we believe like uh, Web3 in the future. Web3 is here to stay. Yes. And thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Yasui, for that time. Thank you. Very glad for us, for Coin Fox, for our team that can meet you. Actually, yeah, we are a big fan of you. Oh, like, thank you so yeah, much. Because yeah, we are as media, yeah, we, we do a lot of research about a company, yes. a lot of project. And as you know, we, when we're talking about yeah, what's a uh, project good or not, right. in our opinion, is who's behind it. Right. And everywhere we look in, into the project, there's always Animoca. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. There's always, what is Animoca? We just about it a long time, three, four years ago. And so glad that I can meet you in person today. Mm. Uh, so I hope uh, that can inspire all builders in Indonesia mm. who watch it too. Because yeah, we believe Indonesia can uh, be strong to Web3. We have a lot of uh, investor market, mm. regulatory who have mm. uh, pushed uh, to adapt it too. Right. And yeah, hope we can meet you soon again in another day. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you.